Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's a great privilege today to be here uh, and to be in attendance today and to share a, a, a bit about our international arbitration experience that we have. Um, Dornberg and SIP are, have very close connections and in this regard, I thought that it would be apt for us to, to share uh, with SIP and their valued clients uh, some of our international arbitration experience uh, actual cases actually in fact and, and I hope that it will be meaningful to uh, many of the valued clients of SIP here who are counsel and you know m who might have heard about you know international arbitration but may not have a very clear grasp of what it entails what the process is what can they do to uh, best protect you know, their uh, company's uh, interests I'm sure many of the counsel here would have seen an arbitration clause in their um, you know sale and purchase contract and, and other commercial contracts, but may not really have a good uh, sense as to what is a good arbitration agreement, how can they best protect uh, their company's uh, interests, legal interests in this regard. And, you know, Indonesia has always been uh, very close ties with Singapore and, and not just in the economic sense. A lot of Singapore's uh, arbitration jurisprudence is actually contributed by disputes from Indonesian uh, uh, parties you know, who have come to Singapore courts to try to set aside the award or try to enforce the award. And in this regard, you know, they've con contributed to Singapore's jurisprudence in arbitration. And I'll just go through some of the uh, uh, cases involving uh, Indonesian parties at the relevant uh, parts of my uh, presentation. Could I have the next slide, please? So just quite briefly, I'll just share with everybody about what is international arbitration. I think all, all of us would be familiar with uh, the concept of litigation. And so how, how is arbitration you know, any different from uh, litigation? Now, most important factor is that uh, arbitration is a private dispute resolution. Uh, it involves non-governmental uh, parties. It is arbitration is essentially a creature of contract. It's created from the arbitration agreement clause that you see in your commercial contracts, and the the chief uh, priority of arbitration is really the parties' uh, uh, autonomy and, and what parties want. So in arbitration, parties can really tailor the process of the. Uh, arbitration itself, you know, you can tailor certain rules as long as both parties agree to it. And the in an arbitration, you know, you don't have judges who are from the government deciding on what uh, the, the final outcome should be. You get arbitrators who are private citizens and individuals. They need not be um, legally trained. You can have, you know, for example, in certain arbitration cases involving construction or IP, you can have, you know, um, uh, engineers who are not legally trained at all be arbitrators because they'll be quite familiar with the technical aspect of it. So one of the um, sort of strong points of arbitration is that you can get subject expertise. You can get people who uh, to, to be uh, arbitrators. You can get people who understand the facts, understand the technical aspects of it in construction, in IP, you know, in many other technical fields. So that's one of the uh, benefits of uh, arbitration over uh, litigation. And the other aspect would be the ability to avoid you know, uh, each party's uh, home jurisdiction. Now, when you have contracts uh, with an international party, let's say you have a contract between an Indonesian party and say a Singaporean party or a Malaysian party for that regard. Let's just use Malaysia and Indonesia uh, as an example. You know, when there's a dispute, both parties would be a bit reticent or reluctant to have the dispute heard in, say, a Malaysian court or an Indonesian court because that's a home ground and that we're not so sure what the rules are and we think that, you know, perhaps our, our side, you know, may be affected because that's a home territory. We may not think that the outcome might be fair to us. Now, what arbitration does is that it provides this neutral medium. Parties can choose a neutral uh, venue, a neutral seat, of arbitration to resolve the dispute. So for example, in uh, the example that I gave regarding a uh, Malaysian uh, party and Indonesian party in a commercial contract, when there's a dispute that arises, you can actually have the arbitration seated in Singapore, which gives the Singapore courts some overview or, uh, and uh, sort of uh, jurisdiction over that uh, uh, arbitration. So it's a neutral territory, you know, so it's fair to both parties. And a lot of the times, you know, um, if in, in Asian countries and Asian companies where they're working with uh, European or US uh, companies, you know, each side may not necessarily uh, be uh, as uh, 
sort of trusting of the other's uh, home jurisdiction or their legal tradition because uh, Indonesia is a civil law country and some countries like Singapore and, and the UK, they are common law countries with very different uh, legal traditions and legal processes. So we might not necessarily want that uh, in, in a dispute. And the other aspect of it is a confidentiality aspect because in, in court, everything is open uh, except for some uh, sealed uh, uh, court events. But in arbitration, there, there's an aspect of confidentiality. Some companies may not want the dispute to be public because it might affect their share prices if they found that, oh, we're being sued by someone. Uh, and it has a lot of repercussions. So arbitration provides that confidential uh, aspect. It keeps uh, the matters, the dispute confidential. And lastly, it is uh, a good tool for parties to resolve that dispute because of the ease of enforcement. Now, if you have a court judgment, it's often uh, faced with several obstacles and it's quite difficult for you to enforce a judgment in another country. Say, let's say we have a, a Indonesian court judgment against a Malaysian uh, company and their assets are all in Malaysia. How do we enforce that uh, judgment uh, in Malaysia? Now, you have to go through several hoop, uh, uh, hoops and and what arbitration does is that they sort of circumvent it in that we have the New York Convention which allows for the direct enforcement of the arbitral award right in the foreign jurisdiction itself. So that's another advantage that parties might uh, wish to consider. Uh, next slide, please. So these are some of the arbitral institutions, uh, chief of all, you know, being from Singapore, of course, I'll put SIAC, Singapore International Arbitration Centre, then you have the London Commercial uh, International Arbitration uh, and you have the International Chambers of Commerce, the Hong Kong International Arbitration Centre and you know, I, I put in a bit of an outlier, the uh, Swedish uh, Chamber of Commerce because they have some interesting rules. Uh, next slide, please. So what exactly is this arbitration process? Now, in litigation, the process is quite clear. It's set out in, for example, in Singapore, in the rules of court. And you know, in civil law countries, it might be in your civil procedure code. You know, it sets out you know, what are the steps to take? How many days that, uh, do we have to file? You know, it sets out quite clearly. But arbitration you know, um, for the process is informed by a lot of things. For example, what parties want the process to be like, what the arbitral uh, institution rules are, and what sort of guidelines that they wish to uh, in take into it. So it's quite a malleable process. No one arbitration process is really uh, you know, entirely the same because parties can give their input as to how they want that arbitration to be like. Now, the process of international arbitration starts with the arbitration agreement, as I've uh, mentioned earlier. Then if there's a dispute, what usually happens is that people then issue a notice of arbitration to the other party and then after that's been done, you go towards the, the stage of appointing arbitrators and then there will be issues of interim measures as well or interlo interlocutory uh, orders and then you move to pleadings and witness statements and we go on to document production which is a, you know, a process which you know, in civil law jurisdictions you don't really have document production and largely because there is no concept of legal privilege in civil law jurisdictions. So there's no need for document production at all. But uh, in arbitration, you know, we take a bit of civil law, we take a bit of common law in it, and they've decided to incorporate this aspect of document production. And after that, you know, we have the hearing stage, and then lastly, the challenge and the enforcement of the award once the award has been issued. Next slide, please. So this is an actual uh, example of a hearing timetable that I took from one of my arbitrations. So of course, relevant parties have been redacted, but this is sort of to show you the timeline and you know, I understand that the uh, font size might be quite small, so only those in front might be able to see it and those at the back, uh, you can use this as an opportunity to test your eyesight. But uh, so essentially it starts with the, um, uh, the notice and it, it, it sets out clearly you know, what are each step you know, what's the uh, step in between how long it takes for the next procedural step in the arbitration. Uh, because the font's so small, I, I won't go too much into it right now. Next slide, please. Uh, next slide as well, let's get that. Next slide again, <laughs> and the next slide. Okay, so now we come to the notice of arbitration. Again, you know, I took this from all my arbitrations as well and, you know, uh, made some hasty redactions. <laughs> and so, what the notice of arbitration sort of looks like, this is just an excerpt from it, you know, it basically 
you know, says, oh, this notice of arbitration is submitted on behalf of this particular party pursuant to, uh, you know, the relevant section of the arbitral institution rules. And this is not the entirety of the notice. The notice will contain uh, facts, uh, contain a brief facts and a brief uh, sort of uh, request for relief. Uh, next slide, please. So we come to the arbitration agreement itself. Now, the arbitration agreement has often been thought of as a midnight clause when parties are discussing, you know, in a, in a contract, you know, trying to get this contract ready, trying to settle the various terms, you know. Arbitration clause is often the last thing that you would want to think about. And so it's often considered a midnight clause. But it really has, you know, very important repercussions in the event that a dispute breaks out. And it's very important for us, you know, to set the tone right. You know, if we have a good arbitration clause and when there's a dispute arises, you know, you already are in favour. And so I'll sort of briefly go through um, some aspects about the arbitration agreement and how can we draft a better, you know, arbitration agreement that is beneficial, you know, to our company, you know, or to our client. So in an arbitration agreement, it contains several ingredients and several components. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, the first of which is the number of arbitrators. <coughs> you have, uh, for example, <coughs> pardon me, it's not COVID, I promise. <coughs> now, you can have either one or three arbitrators. <coughs> and the difference really is in terms of what is the quantum in dispute and how quickly do I want the arbitration to proceed? <coughs> Now, if I want the arbitration to sort of proceed rather quickly, I would try and put one arbitrator because it <clears throat> it's just easier, you know, it's easier to appoint, the process is a bit faster. And generally, you have one arbitrator if the quantum uh, amount in dispute is not very high. When do we need three arbitrators? Now, that's when the uh, commercial contract, for example, is uh, pretty hefty, you know, in terms of the amount that is being transacted. And why do we want three arbitrators? Now that's because when there are three arbitrators, in the event of a dispute, you are able to choose one of the arbitrators of your own choice. So you are able to, in some sense, you know, choose an arbitrator who might be more favourable to your position. The other side you know, appoints their own arbitrator and then the two of these arbitrators then appoint a presiding uh, chair arbitrator to chair the tribunal. <clears throat> the other point that we need to know is the language of arbitration. Uh, language of arbitration. Now, in some arbitration clauses, you know, I've seen some where one of the parties is Chinese and, you know, they ask for bilingual uh, arbitration. So you have English and Chinese as the language of arbitration. Now, this I would strongly discourage having any bilingual arbitration, language of arbitration, because it simply multiplies, you know, the time because one party has to interpret and the other party again has to translate it into their own language, essentially doubles the time, you know, spent in arbitration. So I would quite discourage having, uh, you know, two languages, just have one, maybe English, yeah. And arbitral rules. So arbitral rules, like I mentioned, they form a component as to, you know, what is the civil procedure of this arbitration. So um, depending on which arbitral institute that you pick, there might be some differences you, usually, I would recommend, you know, uh, SIAC because I'm from Singapore, but other equally good uh, arbitral institutes like the London Court of International Arbitration, HKIAC, ICC are also uh, pretty good picks for that. And what is the governing law? So, how is this arbitration going to be resolved? Under whose law will it be resolved under? What is the substantive law in dispute? So, the governing law sets the tone for it. It basically determines, you know, uh, if there's a dispute that arises out of this contract, what law should we apply to determine this dispute? So if you put Indonesian law as a governing law, then this arbitration will be governed by Indonesian law. The contract, interpretation of contract and all that will be Indonesian law. Now, there's also another kind of arbitration agreement which we call multi-tiered arbitration agreements. What are multi-tiered arbitration agreements? Essentially, they input a a further step before you go to arbitration, you have a further step, you know, which requires that parties negotiate or settle their dispute, you know, and if they really can't settle a dispute, then we go to arbitration. And last but not least, we need to understand the concept of separability for arbitration agreements. This is a very important concept because in commercial contracts where, for example, if there's issues of fraud or corruption, these commercial contracts will be rendered void 
and now you know it's no longer a uh, valid uh, contract but the doctrine of uh, separability of an arbitration agreement ensures that even if the main contract is covered say you know by corruption and therefore void the arbitration agreement itself survives that it does not become null and void together with the main uh, contract and that is why you know after you know the allegations of corruption and all that you can still go to arbitration because the clause still exists it's, it's still alive and so you can have a uh, you know, a recourse to arbitration to try and resolve this dispute. Was there corruption or not? Was there a breach of contract? Yeah. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so this is again a sample, you know, arbitration agreement that I took from one of my cases. And in this case, you know, those of you in the front row are lucky enough to be able to see that uh, there's a governing law clause at 9.15, which shows that it should be governed according to the laws of Singapore in this particular contract. And 9.16, again, is a multi-tiered clause where it requires there to be a negotiation or settlement before parties go to um, arbitration. And 9.162, you know, contains all the components that I mentioned earlier. Uh, you know, the seat, the language, what are institutional rules, what's the language, uh, number of arbitrators,